Act One of Love is the Best Doctor by Moliere, translated by Henri Van Laun, eighteen twenty to eighteen ninety six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To the reader, this is only a slight impromptu, a simple pencil sketch which it has pleased the king to have made into an entertainment it is the most hastily composed of all those written by order of his majesty and when i say that it was sketched written learned and acted in five days i shall only be speaking the truth there is no need to tell you that many things depend entirely on the manner of the performance every one knows well enough that comedies are written only to be acted and i advise no one to read this unless he have the faculty while doing so of catching the meaning of the business of the stage i shall say only one thing more that it is to be wished that these sorts of works could always be shown with the same accessories with which they are accompanied when played before the king one would then see them under much more agreeable conditions and the airs and symphonies of the incomparable mr Lully, added to the sweet voices and agility of the dancers invest them undoubtedly with certain graces with which they could with difficulty dispense dramatis personae in the prologue comedy read by t j burns music read by rapunzelina the ballet read by abai in the comedy scania red father to listen read by larry wilson clitendre in love with lucinde read by thomas peter monsieur guillaume dealer in hangings read by victor bizarrasa monsieur jose goldsmith read by craig franklin monsieur tome a physician read by sonia monsieur de Fernandres, a physician read by todd macroton a physician read by son of the exiles monsieur bahi physician read by philip gould monsieur Fillerin, a physician read by alan mapstone the notary read by zames corinne lucinde scanarell's daughter read by jesse percival aminta saginarell's neighbor read by sarah hale lucretia scanarelle's niece read by leanne yao lisette made to lucinda read by eva davis a quack read by nemo stage directions read by sandra schmidt scene paris in one of the rooms of scanarelle's house love is the best doctor l'amour médecin prologue comedy music de ballet let us our fruitless quarrels banish each other's talents not by turns dispute but greater glory to attain the stay of all let be our aim let us all three unite with matchless zeal the greatest king on earth with pleasure to provide let, let us, us all three unite, unite with matchless zeal the greatest king on earth with pleasure to provide from toils more irksome than can be imagined amongst us now and then he comes to unbend can greater glory greater pleasure be our share let us all three unite with matchless zeal the greatest king on earth with pleasure to provide act one scene one Sganarelle aminta lucrecia monsieur guillaume monsieur jos what a strange thing is life and well may i say with a great ancient philosopher that he who has much land has also strife and misfortune seldom comes alone i had but one wife and she is dead and pray how many would you have she is dead friend guillaume i take this loss very much to heart and i cannot think of it without tears 
I was not altogether satisfied with her behavior, and we often quarreled. But after all, death settles everything. She is dead. I bewail her. If she were alive, we would very likely quarrel. Of all the children God sent me, he has left me but one daughter, and it is she who is the cause of my trouble, for I see her plunged in the most dismal melancholy, the greatest sadness, of which there is no way of getting rid, and the cause of which I cannot even learn. I declare I am at my wit's end, and I am very much in want of good advice about it. To Lucretia. You are my niece. To Aminta. You are my neighbor. To Monsieur Guillaume and Monsieur Joss. You my companions and friends. Tell me, I pray, what I am to do. As for me, I think that finery and dress are the things which please young girls most and if i were you i should buy her this very day a handsome set of diamonds or rubies or emeralds and i if i were in your place i would buy her a beautiful set of hangings with the landscape or some figures in them and i should have them hung up in her room to cheer her spirits and to please her eyes as for me i would not take so much trouble i would marry her well and as quickly as i could to that young man who asked her hand some time ago as i have been told and i i think your daughter is not at all fit to be married she has too delicate and unhealthy a constitution and it is almost sending her, willfully and speedily, to the next world, to expose her to bad children in the state she is in. The busy world does not suit her at all, and I would advise you to put her in a convent, where she will find some amusements more to her taste. All this advice is certainly admirable, but I think it rather interested, and I find that you are giving it very much for your own benefit you are a goldsmith monsieur jose and your advice savours of a man who wants to get rid of his wares you sell hangings monsieur guillaume and you look to me as if you had some which you would fain part with the young man whom you are in love with fair neighbour is i have been told the very one who is somewhat favourably disposed towards my daughter and you would not be sorry to see her wife of another. And as for you, my dear niece, it is not my intention, as is well known, to allow my daughter to get married at all, for reasons best known to myself. But your advice to make a nun of her is that of a woman who might charitably wish to become my sole heiress therefore ladies and gentlemen although your counsels be the best in the world with your permission i shall not follow a single one of them alone so much for those fashionable advisers scene two lucinde sganarel ah here is my daughter come to take a breath of air she does not see me she is sighing she looks up to the sky. To Lucinde. May heaven protect you. Good morning, my darling. Well, what is the matter? How do you feel? What? Always so sad and so melancholy? And you will not tell me what ails you? Come, open your little heart to me. There, my poor pet. Come and tell your little thoughts to your little fond papa. Keep your spirits up. Let me give you a kiss. Come. Aside. It makes me wild to see her in that humor. To Lucinde. But tell me, do you wish to kill me with displeasure? And am I not to know the reason of this great listlessness? Tell me the cause, and I promise that I shall do everything for you. Yes, if you will only tell me why you are so sad. I assure you and swear on this very spot 
that I will leave nothing undone to please you. I cannot say more. Are you jealous because one of your companions is better dressed than yourself, and is it some new fashioned stuff of which you want a dress? No. Is your room not furnished nicely enough, and do you wish for one of those cabinets from Saint Laurent's fair? Uh, it is not that. Do you feel inclined to take lessons in something, and shall I get you a master to teach you how to play upon the harpsichord? No, not that either. Are you in love with someone? Do you wish to be married? Lucinde gives an affirmative sign. Scene three. Sganarelle, Lucinde, Lisette. Well, sir, you have just been talking to your daughter. Have you found out the cause of her melancholy? No, she is a hussy who enrages me. Let me manage it, sir. I shall pump her a little. There is no occasion, and since she prefers to be in this mood, I am inclined to let her remain in it. Let me manage it, I tell you. Perhaps she will open her heart more freely to me than to you. How now, madam? You will not tell us what ails you, and you wish to grieve everyone around you? You ought not to behave as you do, and if you have any objection to explain yourself to a father, you ought to have none to open your heart to me. Tell me, do you wish anything from him? He has told us more than once that he will spare nothing to satisfy you. Does he not allow you all the freedom you could wish for? And do pleasure parties and feasts not tempt you? Say, has anyone displeased you? Say, have you not some secret liking for someone to whom you would wish your father to marry you? Ah, I begin to understand you. That is it. Why the do so many compliments? Sir, the secret is found out, and— Go, ungrateful girl. I do not wish to speak to you any more, and I leave you in your obstinacy. Dear father, since you wish me to tell you— Yes, I am losing all my regard for you. Her sadness, sir. She is a hussy who wishes to drive me to my grave. But, father, I am willing. That is not a fit reward for having brought you up as I have done. But, sir— No, I am in a terrible rage with her. But, father— I do not love you any longer. But— She is a slut. But— An ungrateful girl. But— A hussy who will not tell me what is the matter with her. It is a husband she wants. Sganarelle, pretending not to hear. I have done with her. A husband. I hate her. A husband. And disown her as my daughter. A husband. Do not speak to me any more about her. A husband. Speak no more to me about her. A husband. Speak to me no more about her. A husband, a husband, a husband. Scene four. Lucinde, Lisette. True enough. None so deaf as those who will not hear. Well, Lisette, I was wrong to hide my grief. I had but to speak to get all I wished from my father. You see now. Upon my word, he is a disagreeable man. And I confess it would give me the greatest pleasure to play him some trick. But how is it, madam, that till now you have kept your grief from me? Alas, what would have been the use of telling you before? And would it not have been quite as well if I had kept it to myself all my life? Do you think that I have not foreseen all which you see now? that I did not thoroughly know the sentiments of my father, and that, when he refused my hand to my lover's friend, who came to ask for it in his name, he had not crushed every hope in my heart. What? This stranger who asked for your hand is the one whom you? Perhaps it is not altogether modest in a girl to explain herself so freely, but, in short, I tell you candidly, that were I allowed to wish for any one, it is he whom I should choose. We have never had any conversation together, and his lips have never avowed the love he has for me, but in every spot where he had a chance of seeing me, his looks and his actions have always spoken so tenderly, and his asking me in marriage seems to me so very honourable. 
that my heart has not been able to remain insensible to his passion. Yet you see what the harshness of my father is likely to bring all this tenderness. Let me manage it. Whatever reason I have to blame you for the secret you kept from me, I shall not fail to serve your love. And, provided you have sufficient resolution... But what am I to do against a father's authority? And if you will not relent... Come, come, you must not allow yourself to be led like a goose. And, provided it be done honorably, we can free ourselves from a father's tyranny. What does he wish you to do? Are you not of an age to be married? And does he think you are made of marble? once more bear up i shall take in hand your love affair and from this very moment do all i can to favour it and you shall see that i know some stratagems but i see your father let us go in and leave me to act scene five sganarelle alone it is good sometimes to pretend not to hear things which one hears only too well and i have done wisely to ward off the declaration of a wish which i have no intention of satisfying was there ever a greater piece of tyranny than this custom to which they wish to subject all fathers anything more preposterous and ridiculous than to amass great wealth by hard work and to bring up a girl with the utmost tenderness and care in order to strip oneself of one and of the other for the benefit of a man who is nothing to us no no i i laugh at that custom and i mean to keep my wealth and my daughter to myself scene six sganarelle lisette lisette running on to the stage and pretending not to see sganarelle ah oh, what a misfortune ah oh, what a calamity poor mr sganarelle where can i find him sganarelle aside what does she say lisette still running about oh wretched father what will you do when you hear this news sganarelle aside what can it be my poor mistress i am undone ah oh. sganarelle running after lisette lisette what a misfortune lisette what an accident lisette what a calamity lisette oh sir what is the matter sir what has happened your daughter oh oh do not cry in such a way sir you will make me laugh tell me quickly your daughter overcome by your words and seeing how dreadfully angry you were with her went quietly up to her room and driven by despair open the window that looks out upon the river well then casting her looks up to heaven no said she it is impossible for me to live under my father's anger and as he disowns me for his child i shall die she has thrown herself out of the window no sir she gently closed it and lay down upon her bed there she began to cry bitterly all at once she turned pale her eyes rolled about her strength failed her and she became stiff in my arms oh my child she is dead no sir i pinched her till she came to herself again but she relapses every moment and i i believe she will not live out the day champagne 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 scene seven sganarelle champagne Lisette. quick go and fetch some doctors and bring a lot of them one cannot have too many in a crisis like this oh my daughter my poor child first entry champagne servant to sganarelle knocks dancing at the doors of four physicians the four physicians dance and ceremoniously enter into sganarelle's house end of act one Act Two of Love is the Best Doctor by Moliere, translated by Henri Van Laun, eighteen twenty to eighteen ninety six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One, Sganarelle, Lisette. What do you want with four physicians, sir? Is one not enough to kill one person? Hold your tongue. Four heads are better than one. Cannot your daughter die well enough without the assistance of those gentlemen? Do you think people die through having physicians? Undoubtedly, and I knew a man who maintained, and proved it too, by excellent reasons, that we should never say, such a one has died of a fever or from inflammation of the lungs, but such a one has died of four physicians and two apothecaries. Hush! Do not offend those gentlemen upon my word sir our cat had a narrow escape from a leap he took a little while ago from the top of the house into the street he was three days without eating and unable to wag head or foot but it is very lucky that there are no cat doctors else it would have been all over with him for they would have physicked and bled him will you hold your tongue when i bid you what next here they are look out you are going to be finely edified they will tell you in Latin that your daughter is ill. Scene two. Monsieur Thomas, Defon Andres, Macroton, Pais, Scanarelle, Lisette. Well, gentlemen? We have examined the patient sufficiently, and undoubtedly there is a great deal of impurity in her. Is my daughter impure? I mean to say that there is a great deal of impurity in her system and much corrupt matter ah i understand you now but we are going to consult together come uh, hand some chairs lisette to monsieur thomas ah sir are you with them sganarelle to lisette how do you know this gentleman from having seen him in the other day at a dear friend's of your niece how is her coachman very well indeed he is dead dead yes uh, that cannot be i do not know whether it can be or not but i know well enough that it is <laughs> he cannot be dead i tell you and i tell you that he is dead and buried you are mistaken i have seen him it is impossible Hippocrates says that these sorts of diseases end only on the fourteenth or twenty-first day, and he has been ill only six. Hippocrates may say what he likes, but the coachman is dead. Peace, uh, chatterbox. Come, let us leave this room. Uh, gentlemen, I pray you to consult carefully. Although it is not the custom to pay beforehand, yet for fear I should forget it, and to have done with it here is he hands them some money and each one on receiving it makes a different gesture scene three monsieur defon andres thomas macroton pais they all sit down and begin to cough paris is marvellously large and one has to take long journeys when business is a little brisk i am glad to say that i have got a wonderful mule for that and that one would hardly believe what a deal of ground he takes me over daily i have got an astonishing horse and it is an indefatigable animal do you know the ground my mule has been over to-day i have been first close by the arsenal from the arsenal to the end of the faubourg st germain from the faubourg st germain to the lower part of the marais from the lower part of the marais to the porte saint honore from the porte saint honore to the faubourg saint jacques from the faubourg saint jacques to the porte de richelieu from the porte de richelieu here and from here i have yet to go to the place royale my horse has done all that to-day and besides i have been to see a patient at rule but by the by which side do you take in the quarrel between the two physicians theophrastus and artemius for it is a matter that divides our profession i i am for artemius uh -huh. so am i it is true that his advice killed the patient as we have experienced 
and that theophrastus's was certainly much better but the latter is wrong in the circumstances and ought not to have been of a different opinion from his senior what do you say certainly we ought at all times to preserve the professional etiquette whatever may happen for my part i am excessively strict on that subject except among friends the other day three of us were called in to consult with an outsider but i stopped the whole affair and would hold no consultation unless things were conducted according to etiquette the people of the house did what they could and the case grew worse but i would not give way and the patient bravely died during the contention it is highly proper to teach people how to behave and to show them their inexperience a dead man is but a dead man and of very little consequence but professional etiquette neglected does great harm to the whole body of physicians scene four sganarelle monsieur thomas defend andres macroton bais gentlemen my daughter is growing worse i beg you to tell me quickly what you have decided on Monsieur Thomas to Monsieur Defonandres, the word is with you, sir. No, sir, it is for you to speak, if you please. You are jesting. I shall not speak first, sir. Sir. Oh, for mercy's sake, gentlemen, drop these ceremonies and consider that matters are urgent. Your daughter's complaint. After having. Carefully the opinion considered. of all these gentlemen to deduce. ah gentlemen one at a time i pray sir we have duly argued upon your daughter's complaint and my own opinion is that it proceeds from the overheating of the blood consequently i would have her bled as soon as possible and i say that her illness arises from a putrefaction of humours caused by too great repletion Consequently, I would have her given an emetic. I maintain that an emetic will kill her. And I, that bleeding will be the death of her. It is like you to set up for a clever man. Yes, it is like me. And I can, at any rate, cope with you in all kinds of knowledge. Do you recollect the man you killed a few days ago? Do you recall the lady you sent to the other world three days ago? Monsieur Thomas to Sganarelle. I have given you my opinion. Monsieur de Fondandres to Sganarelle. I have told you what I think. If you do not have your daughter bled directly, she is a dead woman. Exit. If you have her bled, she will not be alive a quarter of an hour afterwards. Exit. Scene five. Sganarelle, Monsieur Macroton, Bais which of the two am i to believe and who can decide amidst such conflicting opinions uh, gentlemen i beseech you to guide me and to tell me dispassionately the best means of relieving my daughter sir in these kinds of cases one must proceed very carefully and do nothing inconsiderately as the saying is the more so as the mistakes one may make according to our master hippocrates have the most fatal consequences that is true enough one must take great care what one does for this is not child's play and when a mistake has been made it is not easy to rectify it nor make good what one is spoilt experimentum periculosum it is therefore as well to argue beforehand to weigh things duly to consider the constitution of people to examine the causes of the complaint and to decide upon the remedies to be adopted Sganarelle, aside one moves like a tortoise while the other gallops like a post-horse yes sir to come to the fact i find that your daughter has a chronic disease to which she will succumb if relief be not given her the more as the symptoms give indications of emitting fuliginous and mordicant exhalations which irritate the cerebral membranes and these 
vapours which in the greek we call atmos are caused by putrid tenacious and conglutinous humours which have agglomerated in the abdomen and as these humours were engendered there by a long succession of time they have become ardent and have assumed those malignant fumes that rise towards the region of the brain consequently in order to withdraw to detach to loosen to expel to evacuate these said humours a very strong purgative is necessary but first of all i think it as well and it will not cause any inconvenience to employ some little anodyne medicines that is to say small emollient and detersive injections refreshing juleps and syrups which may be mixed with her barley water after that we will come to the purgatives and to the bleeding which we shall repeat if necessary we do not say that your daughter may not die for all this but you will at least have the satisfaction of having done something and the consolation of knowing that she died according to rule it is better to die according to rule than to recover in violation of eat we have sincerely told you our opinions and we have spoken to you as to our own brother Scanarel to monsieur macroton i am humbly obliged to you to monsieur Baïs, i am very much obliged to you for the trouble you have taken scene six scanarel alone here i am a little more in the dark than i was before zounds i have got an idea i will buy some more viatin and i will make her take it for viatin is a kind of remedy that has done a great deal of good to many so ho scene seven sganarelle a quack will you sir kindly give me a box of your orviatin for which i shall pay you the gold of all climes which by the ocean are bound can e'er it repay this important secret my remedy cures by its excellence rare more complaints than are counted up in a whole year the itch the mange the scurf the fever, the plague, the gout, the smallpox, ruptures, the measles. Great power possesses my orvitin. Sir, I am willing to believe that all the gold in the world could not pay for your remedy. But here is a piece of thirty sous, which you will take, if you please. Admire how good I am. For a few paltry pence, I dispense freely such marvellous treasure with this you may brave quite devoid of all fear all the ills to which mortals are subject down here the itch the mange the scurf the fever the plague the gout the smallpox ruptures the measles great power possesses my orvitin second entry Several Trivelin and Scaramouche, servants of the quack, come in dancing. End of Act Two. Act Three of Love is the Best Doctor by Moliere, translated by Henri Van Laun, eighteen twenty to eighteen ninety six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One. Monsieur Filarin, Thomas de Fonandres. Are you not ashamed, gentlemen, for men of your age to show so little discrimination, and to quarrel like young madcaps? Do you not plainly see? the harm which these kinds of disputes do us with the world and is it not sufficient that the learned perceive the dissensions and differences between our contemporaries 
and the old masters of our craft without revealing to the public by our quarrels and bickering the boasting of our art as for me i do not at all understand the mischievous policy of some of our brethren and it must be admitted that all these controversies have somewhat strangely disparaged us and that if we are not careful we shall ruin ourselves i do not say so for my own interest for heaven be praised my little affairs are already settled whether it blows rains or hails those who are dead are dead and i have sufficient to be independent of the living yet all these disputes do physic no good since heaven has done us the favour that for so many centuries people remain infatuated with us let us not open their eyes by our extravagant cabals and let us take advantage of their folly as quietly as possible we are not the only ones as you know full well who try to make the best of human foibles the whole study of the greatest part of mankind tends towards that and every one endeavours to speculate on man's weakness in order to derive some benefit from them flatterers for example seek to profit by men's love of praise by giving them all the vain incense they crave it is an art by which as we may see large fortunes are made alchemists seek to profit by the passion for wealth by promising mountains of gold to those who listen to them and drawers of horoscopes by their deceitful prophecies profit by the vanity and ambition of credulous minds but the greatest failing in men is their love of life by our pompous speeches we benefit by it and know how to take advantage of the veneration for our profession with which the fear of death inspires them let us therefore maintain ourselves in that esteem in which their foibles have placed us and let us agree before our patients so as to claim for ourselves the credit for the happy issue of the complaint and to throw on nature all the blunders of our art let us not i say foolishly destroy the happy accident of an error which gives bread to so many people and which allows us to raise everywhere such beautiful estates with the money of those whom we have sent to the grave you are right in all that you say but sometimes one cannot control one's temper come gentlemen lay aside all animosity and make up your quarrel on the spot i consent let him allow me to have my way with the emetic for the patient in question and i will let him have his with the first patient he shall be concerned with nothing could be better said and that is reasonable very well that is settled shake hands then farewell another time show more tact scene two monsieur thomas monsieur de fonandres lisette what gentlemen you are here and you do not think of repairing the wrong done to the medical profession what now what is the matter some insolent fellow has had the impudence to encroach upon your trade and without your prescription has killed a man by running a sword clean through his body <clears throat> look you here you may laugh at us now but you shall fall into our hands one of these days if ever i have recourse to you i give you leave to kill me 
Scene three. Clitendre, disguised as a physician, Lisette. Well, Lisette, what do you think of my disguise? Do you believe that I can trick the good man in these clothes? Do I look all right thus? It could not be better, and I have been waiting impatiently for you. Heaven has given me the most humane disposition in the world, and I cannot bear to see two lovers sigh for one another without entertaining a charitable tenderness towards them and an ardent wish to relieve the ills which they are suffering. I mean, no matter at what cost, to free Lucinda from the tyranny to which she is subjected and to confide her to your care. I liked you at first sight. I am a good judge of people, and she could not have made a better choice. Love risks extraordinary things, and we have concocted a little scheme which may perhaps be successful. All our measures are already taken. The man we have to deal with is not one of the sharpest. And, if this trick fail, we shall find a thousand other ways to encompass our end. Just wait here a little. I shall come back to fetch you. Clitendre retires to the far end of the stage. Scene four. Sganarelle, Lisette. Hurrah! Hurrah, sir! What is the matter? Rejoice. At what? Rejoice, I say. Tell me what it is about, and then I shall rejoice, uh, perhaps. No, I wish you to rejoice first. I wish you to sing, to dance. On what grounds? On my bare word. Be it so. He sings and dances. La, 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 la. What the deuce? Your daughter is cured, sir. My daughter is cured? Yes, I have brought you a doctor. But a doctor of importance, who works wonderful cures, and who laughs at the other physicians. Where is he? I shall bring him in. Sganarelle alone. It remains to be seen if he will do more than the others. Scene 5. Clitendre disguised as a physician. Sganarelle, Lisette. Lisette leading Clitendre. Here he is. The doctor has not much beard as yet. Knowledge is not measured by the beard and his skill does not lie in his chin. Sir, they tell me that you have some capital recipes for relieving the bowels. My remedies, sir, are different from those of other physicians. They use emetics, bleeding, drugs, and injections. But I cure by words, sounds, letters, talismans, and rings. Did I not tell you so? Ha <laughs> ha, great man, this. Sir, as your daughter is yonder, ready dressed, in her chair, I shall bring her here. Yes, do. Clitendre, feeling Sganarelle's pulse. Your daughter is very ill, sir. You can tell that here? Yes, by the sympathy which exists between father and daughter. Scene 6. Sganarelle, Lucinde, Clitendre, Lisette. Lisette to Clitendre. Sir, here is a chair near her. To Scanarelle. Come, let us leave them to themselves. Why so? I wish to remain here. Are you jesting? We must leave them. A doctor has a hundred things to ask, which it is not decent for a man to hear. Scanarelle and Lisette retire. Clitendre softly to Lucinde. Ah, lady, how great is my delight and how little do i know how to begin my discourse as long as i spoke to you only with my eyes it seemed to me that i had a hundred things to say and now that i have the opportunity of speaking to you as i wished i remain silent and my great joy prevents my utterance i may say the same and i feel like you thrills of joy that prevent me from speaking Ah, oh, madam, how happy should I be if it were true that you feel all I do, and that I were allowed to judge of your heart by mine. But may I at least believe, dear lady, that I owe to you the idea of this happy scheme which enables me to enjoy your presence. If you do not altogether owe the thought to me, you are, at any rate, my debtor for having gladly approved of the proposal. Sganarelle to Lisette. It seems to me that he talks very close to her. He is studying her physiognomy and all the features of her face. 
clitendre to lucinde will you be constant dear lady in these favours which you are bestowing upon me but you will you be firm in the resolutions which you have taken ah madam till death i desire nothing so much as to be yours and i shall prove it to you sganarelle to clitendre well how does our patient she seems a little more cheerful <clears throat> that is because i have already tried upon her one of the remedies which my art teaches me as the mind has a great influence on the body and as it is from the first that diseases most generally arise my custom is to cure the mind before dealing with the body i have therefore studied this young lady's looks her features and the lines of both her hands and by the knowledge which heaven has bestowed upon me i have discovered she is ill in mind and that the whole of her complaint arises only from a disordered imagination from an inordinate desire of being married as for myself i think nothing more extravagant and ridiculous than this hankering after marriage scanarelle aside a clever fellow this and i have and always shall have a frightful dislike to it scanarelle aside a great doctor this but as we must humour the imagination of patience does i have perceived in her a wandering of the mind and even that there was great danger in not giving her prompt relief i have taken her at her foible and told her that i came here to solicit her hand from you suddenly her countenance changed her complexion cleared her eyes became animated and if you will leave her for a few days in this error you will see that we shall cure her indeed i do not mind after that we shall apply other means to cure her of this fancy yes that will do very well listen my girl this gentleman wishes to marry you and i have told him that i give my consent alas can it be possible of course but really in earnest certainly lucinde to clitendre what you wish to be my husband yes madam and my father consents to it yes my child ah how happy i am if that is true doubt it not madam my love for you my ardent wish to be your husband do not date from today. I came only for this. And if you wish me to tell you the plain truth, this dress is nothing but a mere disguise. I acted the physician only to get near to you, and the more easily to obtain what I desire. These are signs of a very tender love, and I am fully sensible of them. Scanarelle aside. Oh, poor silly girl silly girl silly girl you do consent then father to give me this gentleman for a husband yes certainly come give me your hand give me yours also sir for a moment but sir scanarelle with suppressed laughter no no it is to satisfy her mind take it that is over except as a pledge of my faith this ring which i give you softly to scanarelle it is a constellated ring which cures operations of the mind let us draw up the contract so that nothing may be wanting i have no objections madam softly to scanarelle i will bring the fellow who writes my prescriptions and will make her believe that he is a notary just so hello stand up the notary i have brought with me what you brought a notary with you yes madam i am glad of that oh the poor silly girl the silly girl scene seven the notary clitendre scanarelle lucinde lisette clitendre speaks softly to the notary scanarelle to the notary yes sir you are to draw up a contract for these two people right to lucinde we are making the contract to the notary i give her twenty thousand crowns as a portion write that down 
I am very much obliged to you, dear father. That is done. You have only to sign it. That is a quickly drawn contract. Clitendre to Scannarelle. But at least, sir. No, no, I tell you. Do we not all know? To the notary. Come, hand him the pen to sign. To Lucinde. Come, you sign now. Sign, sign. Well, I shall sign presently. No, no. I will have the contract in my own hands. Well, there then. After having signed. Are you satisfied? Better than you can imagine. That is all right, then. That is all right. I have not only had the precaution to bring a notary. I have also brought singers, musicians, and dancers to celebrate the feast and for our enjoyment. Let them come in. They are people I always have with me, and whom I daily make use of to calm, by their harmony and dancing, the troubles of the mind. Scene 8. Comedy, the ballet, music. Without our aid, all humankind would soon become unhealthy. We are indeed the best of all physicians. Would you dispel by easy means splenetic fumes that man is heir to? Avoid Hippocrates and come to us. Without our aid, all humankind would soon become unhealthy. We are indeed the best of all physicians. While the sports, laughter, and pleasures are dancing together, Clitendre leads Lucinde away. Scene 9. Sganarelle, Lisette, Music, the Ballet, Sports, Laughter, Pleasures. A pleasant way of curing people, this. But where are my daughter and the doctor? They are gone to finish the remaining part of the marriage. What do you mean by the marriage? The fact is, sir, you have been cleverly done, and the joke you thought to play remains a truth. The devil it does! He wishes to rush after Clitendre and Lucinde. The dancers restrain him. Let me go! Let me go, I tell you! The dancers still keep hold of him. Again! They wish to make him dance by force. Plague take you all! End of Act 3 End of Love is the Best Doctor by Moliere, translated by Henri van Laun, 1820 to 1896.